Today on the Locked On Hornets podcast, I tell you what I learned about the Charlotte Hornets from the week that was, what you learned about the Charlotte Hornets from the week that was, and in case you missed it, that's all today on the Locked On Hornets podcast. You are Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cause we live. We live. We live. <laughs> Welcome in, welcome in, welcome in. It's Locked On Hornets. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Hornets your first listen every day. We are free and daily wherever you get podcasts, and that includes YouTube. I'm Doug Branson, no Walker Mail today. He'll be back with me uh, tomorrow, or not tomorrow, tomorrow's the weekend. He'll be back with me on Monday. You can get more of his Hornets thoughts on WFNZ, where you can catch him 12 to 3 every weekday on the Wes and Walker Show. You can get more of me on my Substack every Hornets box score where where I will be covering the Charlotte Hornets playing the Phoenix Suns tonight. That will be a very interesting game. The first time in a little bit that the Hornets have played like one of the elite teams in the NBA. So they've struggled against bad teams. They've played okay against sort of middling teams. Now we'll see how they do against one of the NBA's elite. Uh, Make sure to join my subtext as well. It is uh, the, the perfect way for the Sicko and you uh, to to get all up to date on the latest and be part of the show. I'm actually going to use some of what's happened on subtext. Join subtext.com slash lockdown hornets. Um, I asked what what my sicko brigade members what they have learned about the week that uh, was in Charlotte Hornets basketball. So I'll read some of that. Uh, so again, join subtext.com forward slash locked on hornets. But before I get to some of the things that you learned and some of the things that you may have missed this week. I want to talk about what I've learned this week. And the first thing is really jumping off of yesterday's episode where we talked a lot about Vasa Micic, the 30-plus-year-old rookie EuroLeague MVP who comes to the Hornets via the trade deadline from Oklahoma City Thunder, from the Oklahoma City Thunder, where he was buried in the lineup, didn't have an opportunity to showcase his skills, and now he does. And now he does in a big way because LaMelo Ball is hurt. And so now he is starting point guard, but not only that, he's one of the few really competent to above average playmakers that exist on this Hornets roster. And so a lot of, if not all of the offense when he's on the floor, is going to in some way involve him unless it's a Brandon Miller pull-up early in the shot clock or a Miles Bridges pull up early in the shot clock. And I think that what Meechus has shown this week in, in setting the career highs that he did in the win against Memphis, but just in his play overall, is that he's quickly turning in to what could be a very good problem for the Hornets to have. I listened to his postgame comments uh, against Memphis uh, after the Memphis game. And and really what I take away from those comments is that he understands that he's getting really a golden opportunity to showcase his skills because LaMelo Ball is out. But he also understands that once LaMelo Ball is healthy, he's under no sort of illusion that he's going to continue to be the starting point guard. But he does believe that you know once he gets a handle on the NBA game, I th- or at least I, for what I take from a lot of his comments and a lot of the things that he said since he's joined the NBA is that he thinks he can be an elite player. And so will when all of that is said and done, if he continues to play great for the rest of the season and the LaMelo ball remains out, next season the Hornets have him under contract. And it is a great contract because it is a rookie contract. And so it, which would make it actually much more tradable if he is playing well. Will he accept a role off the bench if it's a major role? Say it's a six-man type of role. It's not like, well, you're the backup point guard. Say it's, no, you're like you're like the guy that we depend on off the bench. You're first off the bench. You're playing similar to starter minutes. You know, it's a, uh, it's a role that a lot of six-man play where it's like, yeah, they're, they qualify for six-man of the year, but they're basically a starter. If it's that kind of role, would he even accept that? Or does he see himself as sort of a – future Luka Doncic, you know, lead, playmaker, score, do-it-all kind of guy 
in the league? And does he will he want to pursue that? Will he be unhappy? I think that's a big question because if he's not, if he is willing to accept that role, that would be a huge boon for the Charlotte Hornets. But that's the kind of good problem you want the Hornets to have. Too much talent? That's <laughs> not something we're used to here as Charlotte Hornets fans. So that's one thing I learned. The other thing I learned is that the Hornets have one way to win right now. Without all of these players that they're missing, LaMelo Ball, Mark Williams, on and on down the line, Cody Martin, Seth Curry. I mean, Cody Martin and Seth Curry's absence – is a big reason why Vasa has so much on his shoulders right now because those two were playmakers in the extreme for the Charlotte Hornets when they were on the floor. They have one way to win right now, and it has nothing to do with what Clifford preaches, nothing to do with rebounding, nothing to do with limiting turnovers. All of those things are great. Those will be cherries on the top. It would make winning a little bit easier than it has been. They've won two out of their last three games, but it would make it easier it, it all has to do with getting out and, and running in transition, playing with pace offensively. But that the, the offense is so bad right now in the half court that if they don't get out and run, if they don't force steals like Brandon Miller was doing at the opening of the fourth quarter, if, if Voss is not pushing the pace, then it ends up being a bad Miles Bridges shot. Then it ends up the ball moving. Sometimes, and you saw this in the Memphis game, sometimes the Hornets move the ball, but it just it doesn't really go anywhere. And it's a strange thing to say. They're moving the ball and it doesn't go anywhere. But it's just getting kicked around the perimeter. There's no real idea of what the offensive possession is supposed to develop. But when you're out and running in pace, all of that goes away and you have an inherent advantage. And so really that's the only way they're going to win, to give themselves a chance to win, is to force turnovers on the defensive end. And even if they don't, when they get defensive rebounds, push, push, push. So that'll be a big indicator over the next couple of weeks if LaMelo Ball remains out. If they're pushing the pace, they're going to give themselves a chance to be in the game. Another thing I learned, with a double-digit win against the Nets, the Hornets avoided infamy. According to Seth Partnow on the Athletics NBA show, the Hornets were on track to be the only team in the modern NBA to finish a season without a double-digit win. And it would have been extremely ironic for the Hornets to set that kind of infamous NBA record in a season where the Detroit Pistons were on the verge before they played the Hornets three times. <laughs> they were on the verge of stripping the Bobcats of their 7-59 and worst winning percentage all-time record. Now that's pretty much out of the cards, but... Uh, it would have been ironic for the Hornets to set that. But that's all gone now. Because now, in in those two out of the last three wins, uh, they've, they've both been double digits. So, kudos to the Hornets for pi- finally pulling away offense, generating just enough to have that double-digit win. Final thing that I learned, and then we're going to move on to what you learned this week. Brandon Miller, the rookie sensation. Uh, he might not believe in the rookie wall. But his outside shooting stroke surely does. The arms look tired. Uh, he's he's getting it up a lot, but he is not getting them to go down. He has shot 30 or below percent in uh, a number of games, uh, a majority of his games in the past 10 to 15. And so, look, you know, it it's one of those things where he has probably had more on his shoulders as a rookie than the Hornets intended him to have but it's a reality a reality of the situation. It's been good for him, I think, to get all of this experience and to see the amount of attention that he's seeing from defenses that is probably in some way limiting his ability to get open shots because so many times when he's taking shots, he's the focus. Uh, he's the focus of the offensive plan and he's the focus of the opposing defense. And so it makes sense, not worried about it, but it's certainly something they have to look at. All right, coming up next on the Locked on Hornets podcast. The focus now shifts to you. I ask the folks on the Sicko Brigade, join subtext.com forward slash Locked on Hornets, what they learned about the week that was in Charlotte Hornets basketball. That's next on the Locked on Hornets podcast. This episode of the Locked on Hornets podcast is brought to you by our partners at eBay Motors. We have teamed up with Locked on Fantasy Basketball host Josh Lloyd to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week 
all season long, whether you're prepping for a daily draft or scouting the waiver wire every week, we are going to provide you players that are a guaranteed fit on your roster as you prepare for your fantasy basketball playoffs. So let's see who Josh has picked out for us this week's in this week's eBay Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks of the Week. And I am going to pick out Grady Dick. The Raptors seem committed to giving us 30 minutes of Dick each night. Now, hold on a minute. Now, Josh Lloyd, I know Josh Lloyd. And I know that he did that on purpose. Okay, folks? The Raptors seem committed to giving us 30 minutes of Dick each night as they rotate in and out of other players in their lineup. And listen, I'm just going to tell you this right now. Rough star for Grady Dick in his rookie season. But if he continues to play like this, I'm going to tell you a little bit of analysis here from me, uh, Doug Branson, Locked On Hornets. He is quickly going to ascend my list of most famous dicks in basketball history that I gave you over the offseason. I mean, all he has to do is get to number 10, Dick Garrett, number nine, Dick Barnett, number eight, Dick Van Arsdale. I think he can get there. I think he sits right there, you know, continues to play like this right under Dick McGuire. So we're going to see. Uh, but that's that's Josh's pick. That's my pick. Josh Lloyd from Locked On Fantasy Basketball is going to help you win your fantasy championship. And eBay Motors knows a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. Uh, with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof rack, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber and not burning cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. More Locked On Hornets ahead. Back here on the Locked On Hornets podcast, I ask the Sicko Brigade, what did you learn about the week that was in Charlotte Hornets basketball? And I got a lot of responses, so I want to make sure I get to those, get to all of them. So this might be a little bit of of rapid-fire response here. But I also want to tell you, if you are listening, head over to YouTube, comment on what you learned. And um, and if you're on YouTube right now, obviously hit the comments, tell me what you learned about the Hornets this week. And uh, I'll try to jump in the comments and chop it up a little bit with you as well. Here we go. 843 tells me, I learned that we have pieces that can help us win once we are healthy. I learned we are going to have a good bench in the future, and they have a six seed potential next year. Wow. 843 jumping out there with the major hope. I love it. That's sicko material right there. Six seed. We've been thinking about a six seed for six years (laughs) and I love it. I love it. Uh, I don't know about six seed next year. I want to hope like that too. I probably will once the uh, off season finishes and we get into training camp, I'll probably be right there saying Vegas has no idea what they're talking about. Uh, But in the meantime, I think you're right about the good bench. You know, and, and that's the thing about having all of these players that they, they traded for be under contract for next season under decent contracts. I mean, apart from Bertans, it, which is a deal that they can either, if, if Bertans really likes his role here and wants to continue to be in Charlotte, they can rework that deal into something that makes a little bit more sense than what he's making right now. But other than that, I mean, you're talking about guys who are all on multi-year contracts and reasonable deals. I mean, that's what makes that trade deadline so amazing. Typically, if you're going to trade and get first round picks back, you're going to get bad contracts or short contracts. You're typically not going to get rookie contracts for players that have potential. Insane. Okay, next up is Adam. Adam says, number one thing I learned, Memphis versus Hornets is a better dunk contest than the actual contest. Wow. Yeah. I mean, Miles Bridges on the yam that he had where he just took off through the lane. That was hilarious because that play probably should have never existed because the challenge previous to that wasn't allowed because Memphis got a delay of game penalty that then disallowed their ability to challenge it. But it was a clean strip of Bridges on the prior play, and then they give him some second-chance yams on that one. That was a a really crazy dunk. Uh, Adam also says, Poku isn't bad. Thunder may be too deep for them to afford everyone as they develop. Well, yeah, I mean, that's... Of course, yeah. I mean, the Thunder have so many good players that they really could afford to move on from some players who they weren't going to extend or had no reasonable expectation to extend contractually, and Poku was one of those players. 
And I think you're totally right. Poku is not bad at all. In fact, one of the other things that I learned this week is Poku's got the sauce offensively. Like, he does some things offensively. Like, you're like, ooh, ah, okay, all right, sir. I wasn't familiar with your game. But defensively is where I think he's making the most impact right now. His ability to block shots in the lane and and help defense has been something they haven't had because they really haven't had a lot of bigs to begin with. But his shot blocking ability is a game changer. Even Miles Bridges said it after the Memphis game. Like Poku on defense helped turn that game around along with Vasa on offense. So Balkan Bros, love it. Haley of the 12th Dwight Howard division says, I learned the Swarm play with more energy than the Hornets. LOL. Also, is there any update about Najee, James Najee, their uh, second round draft pick last off season who was sent to Barcelona or sent back to Barcelona, I guess. Do you ever check on him? I love that the Hornets beat the Grizzlies in front of Scottie Pippen watching his son, very on brand for MJ's team. (laughs) As long as MJ owns 1% of this team, they will always try hard against a Scottie Pippen. Um, do I check on James Najee? I will say no, I'm not totally up to date on Najee, but James Plowright uh, did a great article, which I'll, I will link for allhornets.com, and he spoke with Gerard Soleil of Dizone Espana, and I'll read the quote here, but you should go read the article because he does some extra scouting if you're like really, if you really got to know about James Najee. Here's the quote. When Najee is on the court, he's trying to be a dominant presence in the zone, but he hasn't had the same level of impact as last year. He's struggling to get good offensive opportunities, fewer alley-oops this year, and he's committing more fouls. I think that opponents now know him more and are putting him in a more difficult defensive situation. My take on James Najee is that if, if you're not hearing about him, that's probably not a great sign. It's it not necessarily a bad sign, but it's not a great sign because if you were tearing it up overseas, I feel like the Hornets would sort of make that known. They wouldn't make it a giant focus. You wouldn't be hearing James Najee's name all the time, but if you were doing great things and you were on the verge of coming over, you're gonna. the Hornets are going to hint at that through social media, through the broadcast. You know what I'm saying? Like if he were in if he were in danger of being Euroleague MVP, like our guy uh Vasimicic, you would know about it. <laughs> so if you're not hearing things about James Najee, uh it's probably not a great sign. So uh moving on, five six four says they learned that Memphis is a much smaller market than the Hornets. Of the 30 NBA cities, Charlotte ranks 17th in metro population and 21st in Nielsen TV market. They're 28th, at, uh, Memphis is uh, 28th and 30th. Also, market size is not a predictor of success. See Spurs, Bucks, OKC, Grit and Grind, Grizz, Pacers, Portland, Utah, etc. Yet somehow it's the crutch the previous GM leaned on for his entire tenure to excuse his incompetence. Strong words from 564. But I tend to agree with most of that, which is that, yes, Charlotte is a small market. There are advantages to Charlotte in that I think there are there's a certain type of player that wants to be in a city where they can be a little bit more anonymous, okay? And so the Hornets have to be careful to target those kind of players because if you do want to come to a city, look, there are players that like to be in Miami. There are players that like to be in New York and L.A. And there are things about those scenes that they enjoy. And then there are players like Kimball Walker who wanted to buy a house in South Charlotte and everybody will leave him the hell alone, <laughs> right? I mean, there are all kinds of personalities in the NBA and among even among the star players. There is no one type of star player. And so the Hornets have to constantly keep their eye out for that kind of player who they can sell on that idea. But you sell that player on that idea after you get them here. It's not going to be the thing that sells them on Charlotte, but it's not impossible to build that kind of thing. Now, the Spurs and the Bucks, those are two franchises that really had incredible luck. In the, well, the Spurs just kept getting the number one draft pick and still continue to this day. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. But the Bucks, I mean, that was incredible draft luck to take a chance there on Giannis and for Giannis to explode physically the way he did. I mean, it wasn't just like people didn't know Giannis's game. 
there was still we were still in the blurry, you know, MPEG four era of like, what well, I don't know if this player's good or not. I don't know. I can't even see the footage. But the way he transformed physically was something that no one anticipated. Okay. So that's luck. OKC, that's skill, grit and grind, Grizz. That was skill in drafting. Um, pacers, patience, and skill in the trade market. Um, so, but but you're right. It's not impossible for smaller markets to compete. There are there are challenges, certainly. And this franchise for too long used it as an excuse. And I hope I never hear that from Jeff Peterson. Let's think about positive. Let's let's not and let's not voice that. Even if you feel that way, why put that into the air? I don't I don't understand that. Okay, more ahead on the Locked On Hornets podcast coming up. I've got a few things that you may have missed in life, the universe, everything, paying attention to all that, plus the Charlotte Hornets. There are a few things that may have fallen through the cracks. Friday, third segment, perfect time to get to them. We'll get to that in just a moment. This episode of the Locked On Hornets podcast is brought to you by Stitch Fix. You know that instant confidence boost that you get from an outfit that makes you look really good? Uh, That's what I get when I use Stitch Fix. Easily upgrade your wardrobe this year with a professional stylist that helps you find new on-trend favorites that will work for you. I really need one for my for my hat collection. Um, it's you know I haven't had a lot of time to get to it, and you know Stitch Fix. I'm I'm gonna ask if Stitch Stitch Fix can help me out with that as well. Uh, but here's what I do do with Stitch Fix. I just give the stylist my size, style, budget preferences. I order boxes when I want and how I want. No subscription required. And they said five just for me pieces plus outfit recommendations and pro styling advice. I keep what works and I send back the rest. My stylist always sends just right pieces and the fit is on point. It's like they have style ESP. I don't know how they do it, but they just understand what my style is all about. Stitch Fix makes it all so easy. I don't like to shop. I don't. I hate it. I hate leaving the house, going into a store. It's not my cup of tea. So they save me the time and effort. Plus, I get outfits that make me look and feel really, really good. And if you don't love something, you just send it back. Shipping, returns, exchanges, they're always free. Style that makes you feel as good as you look. Get started at stitchfix.com slash locked on. That's stitchfix.com slash locked on. Stitchfix.com slash locked on. More Locked On Hornets ahead. Last segment of the Locked On Hornets podcast. Thanks so much for bearing with me. You might, have, if you're watching on YouTube, you might see the red eyes. You, uh, if you're listening really intently, you might hear the little bit of gravel in my throat. The few times that it catches, I am on the back end of an allergy attack. And so I appreciate you bearing with me here this week as we kind of work through that natural. Every time. I mean, it's just March around this time when stuff starts blooming, people cut their grass and my face explodes. All right, so... I've got a few things for you that may have fallen through the cracks and you might have missed. One just happened recently. I don't know if you saw this on your timeline, but Kai Jones, the former first-round pick of the Charlotte Hornets in 2021, who the Hornets released before the season kicked off this season, signed a 10-day with the Philadelphia 76ers, a playoff team, a team that uh, is routinely now catching cast-offs from the Charlotte Hornets, including Kelly Oubre Jr. Kai Jones now gets a 10-day with the Sixers, who are obviously missing their star center, Joel Embiid. Probably going to come back for the playoffs. But Kai Jones gets may, may get an opportunity here to get a few minutes. And, and I really, all I have to say on it is this. That typically when a player leaves the Charlotte Hornets, um, I don't cheer for them to do poorly. But, I, but there's some part of me that hopes that they don't become a superstar after they leave the Charlotte Hornets because I don't want the franchise, especially if I agree with letting them go. Like, I agreed that Kelly Oubre's time was probably over in Charlotte. You certainly don't want that player to then go and become a superstar. Like, I don't, you know, again, I don't want them to do badly. I don't want them to drop out of the league. I don't want, certainly don't want them to get hurt. But there is a small part of me, if we're being honest, that, you know, and, and maybe you feel the same way. You don't want to watch them because you know the national media at that point is going to say, well, look at the stupid Hornets. They, they didn't know what they had. And it's like, well, yeah, but all this context and, they, well, he wasn't exactly. And everybody's like, shut up. 
<laughs> you know what you're talking about. You let this player go, and now he's a superstar. But with Kai Jones, I legit hope he does. I hope he maxes out. I hope he does. I hope whatever stuff that he was dealing with while he was in Charlotte, that he has taken the time away. And I know he was playing overseas, but I hope he's taken the time away from the NBA, the pressures that are involved with playing in the NBA. I hope he's gotten that figured out. That's what I really hope, like at foundational level, that he's gotten that figured out and that this 10-day represents a clean slate for him and not a continuation of those pressures and of those problems. But this 10-day with the Sixers, I really hope like he just explodes. And it, it just wasn't meant to be with the Charlotte Hornets. That's unfortunate. But, um, you know, I just really hope he does well. So that's it. Uh, all right, the other thing. I don't know if you saw this. The Hornets and the city of Charlotte have reworked their deal on renovations to the Spectrum Center and the Hornets' new practice facility. So just a little bit of background. Uh, because of the deal that the, the city of Charlotte and the team have, uh, the city of Charlotte was sort of boxed in. They had to commit a certain amount of money to renovating the Spectrum Center and the practice facility. And I think that dollar amount was like $245 million. So that, that money got split up between the arena and the new practice facility. When the new owners came in, they went to the city of Charlotte and they said, look, we want to invest more money in the practice facility than we originally, than the franchise previously wanted to invest. We want to make it bigger and better. We want to, we're not going to put it on the transit center anymore that sits in downtown. We're going to put it on this gravel lot, brand new building. It's going to create a, a district like the Deer District in Milwaukee. It's going to create this entertainment district around the Charlotte Hornets. And then if they get good, it explodes, right? Everything's great. So they wanted the city of Charlotte to take more of the money that they had committed to the practice facility, put that into Spectrum Center, and then the ownership group would have full control of the practice facility building, including naming rights, tenants, money. So the, Char the city of Charlotte would get tax revenue from that building, theoretically, uh, but they wouldn't get any, <clears throat> they wouldn't make any money on naming rights or anything else. They wouldn't sort of, you know, get, get anything back from there. And so, but they also wouldn't be on the hook for that building. You know, the city wouldn't be on the hook for that building if, I don't know, if something went wrong with construction or the Hornets, God forbid, the Hornets moved one day. Now the city has this building. Then uh, No, the, the team will own that building now. So there's sort of, there's sort of a give and take here from what I understand and uh, th this hasn't been fully approved by the city, but it looks to be moving that way. It's, it's moved through some committees and such. And so what, this, what I think about this is that uh, it, I don't love the idea of the city of Charlotte putting $30 million towards a practice facility building that they don't have any ownership of. That, that sort of stinks. But at the same time, I do like the idea that the ownership group is putting more money, more of their own money, in investing in a world, not only a world-class practice facility, but also building up an entertainment district. Because if the Hornets do, you know, if Brandon Miller is an all-NBA superstar in the making, and in four, five, six years, the Hornets are contending for an Eastern Conference Finals appearance, or I don't know, a Finals perspective, I, you know what? I'll take a playoff series win. If they're contending for a playoff series win, you want people crowded down on Trade Street around that arena. And right now, for those that don't aren't familiar with that area of, of of Charlotte or Charlotte at all, there's not really a great place for folks to gather, and where there are like shops and different things and places to grab a beer. It just doesn't exist in that particular part of Charlotte. And so I like the idea of them trying to build that up for future All-Star Weekend appearances and such. So we'll see. But that's just uh, something there. Uh, but at all, and what I like too is it's a bet. It's a bet by the organization that they will be good. Because if you build it, it's like build it and they will come, maybe. If you build an entertainment district and you don't have an entertaining product, what do you really have? So it puts pressure on the organization. They're putting pressure on themselves to put a winner in Charlotte, and I hope it's exactly what they do. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Locked on Hornets podcast. 
this week. Thanks for making us your first listen. Go check out uh, Locked On Sports Today on YouTube. It's a 24-7 feed. Also, baseball fans, mark your calendars. March 20th, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. The MLB season preview is coming exclusively to that Locked On Sports Today feed. March 20th, 7 p.m. Eastern, a MLB season preview. Check it out. YouTube, search for Locked On Sports Today. For Walker and David and Nada and our whole family here at uh, the Locked On Hornets podcast, I'm saying go Hornets, go America. Let's swarm Charlotte. I'm going to go get some uh, allergy medicine.